Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Worship Online. Our worship begins with the words of the acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. Let us pray. O Lord, you have taught us that without love, all our deeds are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of charity, that true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. A reading from the eighth chapter of Amos. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances? that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for only an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Even before the gods will I sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your loving kindness and truth. For you have magnified your name and your word above all things. When I called upon you, you heard me and gave me increase of strength. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord be high, yet he has respect for the lowly. As for the proud, he beholds them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shall you refresh me. You shall stretch forth your hand upon the furiousness of of my enemies, and your right hand shall save me. The Lord shall make good his loving kindness toward me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever, despite not the works of your own hands. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, Lord Christ. Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called to him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to, to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. Father, we are grateful for this morning, and we would, uh, we would have you speak to us afresh. We would have you convict our hearts of truth and of beauty and of justice and of your mercy, um, that we might repent, that we might be changed. We ask, Lord, that you would do that by your Spirit, that you would lead our time this morning, that it would be for our good and for your glory. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, friends. We are continuing our walk through Luke together. I encourage you to follow along on um, on the screen or on a, on a Bible in a Bible at home or on your phone. It's a strange passage this morning from Luke, isn't it? I mean, Luke is no stranger to hard teachings. He regularly seems to come out swinging, doesn't he? Forcing us to reconsider our understanding of the world and our way of interacting with it. And this morning is a hard word yet again. But it's not only a challenging teaching, it's also just challenging to understand. It's hard to figure out what Jesus is saying here, especially at the beginning of our reading. Our passage begins with another parable. It's a story, this time about the manager or a steward of a wealthy house who has been caught mismanaging funds. The master of the house gets word of this, that his steward has been cheating him, and so he tells the man, to get the house in order because he's going to be fired. Now, a household steward in that day was a particularly powerful position, especially in a house as powerful as this one must have been. Poor but free men were actually known to sell themselves into servitude in a rich house like this because to become the bond servant steward of a rich house would actually be a boost in their status from being a free man. This is how much power this man, this steward, would have had working in the house. It was a prestigious role. But to be fired from that position was not only to lose your job, it was to lose your status. It was to lose whatever income you have 
as well as any security you had from the position or any relationships you'd built in that position. It was a fall not only from wealth, but from grace. So the steward was in trouble. Not only was he losing his job, he was losing standing in the community in such a way as to make it nearly impossible for him to be rehired by any other household. He would fall from grace and stay down. His choices were pretty limited. He could either accept the shame of destitution and beg for a living or work menial slave labor, digging, he says. And he can't endure the thought of either one. So what can he do? This is what he does. He calls in those men who owe his master enormous debts. His master apparently is very rich because his debtors themselves owe tremendous sums to him. The debts are clear the debtors are clearly in high positions themselves. And so the steward wants to make sure he's on their good side when all is lost, making sure that he's still friends with them in the hopes that they might take him in, maybe even give him some work. So what does he do? He invites them in and he begins to cut their bills. He cuts their debts in front of them. Let's take half off this bill. Let's take a big chunk off of that one. Don't worry, this is just business between friends, you know. See what he's doing. I mean, it's certainly not ethical, but it's clever. The steward knows the time is up. He knows that judgment is falling on him, and so he may as well make the best with what he has. So this is what the master commends him for. He's not commending his steward for cheating him out of money. No, that wouldn't make any sense at all. He's commending him for being clever, for planning ahead for when time runs out for what is coming in the judgment of the master. And this is what Jesus commends too. He's not commending the cheating of the steward. That would go against everything Jesus has taught up until this point. No, Jesus commends the steward's cleverness. The steward recognizes judgment coming and makes the best with what he has. And so, Jesus says, should you. Judgment is coming, he says. Time is only ever running out. The sand falls through the hourglass in one direction. The top of the hourglass is only ever diminishing. So the wise thing is to do whatever you can with whatever you have at hand to prepare for it, to prepare for judgment. This reminds me of uh, hurricane season a bit. You know, growing up, you're always watching the tropics for this or that wave, this or that tropical depression, plotting them on the maps that we used to get from the grocery store. There comes a point when the storm is no longer in doubt. It's reached hurricane status. You're just waiting to figure out its track. You know, the spaghetti models are running across the Atlantic, and you're trying to figure out which course this storm is going to follow. And there comes another time a few days down the line when the tracks begin to narrow and it becomes apparent exactly where that hurricane is going to go. And if it's coming where you are, you know, living in Charleston, that happened regularly enough, only the fool would ignore that. When you know that the hurricane is coming, you go to the store and you buy what you need and you board up the house and you clear out the yard and if it's really bad, you run, usually to Spartanburg. You get out of there. And in that moment, it doesn't really matter if plywood or sandbags weren't in the budget for the month. It doesn't really matter if there's a big game this weekend or if the recital was meant to be held on Saturday. If the storm is coming, time is up, all other bets are off. You use whatever resources you have to get ready for it. See, this is something like judgment as Jesus describes it in this parable, like the the judgment of the master on the steward, like God's judgment falling on creation, on us. It is as inevitable as a storm. All the models agree. It's coming, and so we ought to use whatever resources we have to prepare for it. And as it happens, how you use your resources is precisely how you will be judged. Verses 10 to 12 kind of open that up a little bit. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. 
If then you have been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? You see judgment based on what is done with the things in your hand. Now it's strange though, in these two verses, Jesus uses a phrase he's already used in the parable, the phrase is unrighteous wealth. I wonder if you caught that. It's a strange phrase. He seems to tie it to this idea of wealth that belongs to another. Wealth that's not our own. What do you think he's talking about there? What does it mean when Jesus talks about unrighteous wealth? Where it seems that Jesus is comparing us, human beings, to the steward and the parable. We tend to think that our money, our house, our resources are our own. The Bible, though, is very clear that everything we have is God's and everything we hold is simply on loan from Him. We are stewards in God's house, as it were. In fact, the primary reason that God commands us to give to the church and to give to those in need is not just because the church and the poor need resources to function, though we do, and I would encourage you to give, and the poor do, and I'd encourage you to give. No, God doesn't just command us to give because He needs it. No, God commands us to give to remind us that all that we have actually belongs to him. We give a fraction that we rec- so that we would recognize that the rest is his too. It's the, the first fruits to remind us that the rest of the harvest only comes from his hand. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything that exists, whether it's in our pocket or not, exists for his purposes. Well, now someone says, I worked hard for this house. I worked hard for this car, for this retirement account. I deserve what I have. I've earned it. Well, I'm sure you did work hard. You know, but where did that drive to work come from? How about the resources that got you the degree that you needed to get this job? What about the connections that got you the job? What about the hands that you worked with? Where did those come from? Did you give yourself all these things? I mean, moreover, consider the migrant laborer who picks seasonal fruit on hands and knees in different seasons up and, long, up and down the East Coast. They've worked harder than any of us have worked every day of their lives until now. Do they deserve their poverty as much as you deserve your wealth? Did you give yourself these things, really? No, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. That's what Scripture teaches us. That's what Jesus points at in this morning's reading. All that we have is the Lord's. We only have what we have been given. We have only been given what we have on loan. It's all the Lord's. We are stewards in His house of his things. Well, now that same person might say, I think it's possible to follow God and still keep my wealth, money, business, personal life. These are my personal things. They're what I do. God's stuff is God's stuff. And I support that stuff. I give money to the church. I come on Sundays. I follow the rules. I'm a good Christian. I give God what he asks for, but that's entirely separate from how I organize my life or my retirement or my money. But Jesus doesn't think so, you see. Jesus doesn't think you can separate the two, and that's how he ends the passage. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't follow God and keep your financial plans to yourself as though it's not his. You can't follow God without submitting your wealth to him. You cannot serve God and money as though there are two different parts of your life separated from one another. It's not possible. Either it's all God's or none of it's God's at all. So Jesus, in a sense, this morning tells us to pick teams. Either you are 
subject to your wealth, serving your own interests unto death and nothingness? Or everything you have belongs to God and all of it exists to serve his purposes? Those are the two options. And of course, we know the right answer. Pick God. Do what he says. That's the right answer. But the problem is, of course, that if we're going to submit our things to the Lord, we might have to use them differently. We might have to give more of our stuff away to people in need. We might not get to buy the house we wanted or the car we wanted. Because God might call us to a different place or a different lifestyle. If we submit everything to the Lord, we might have to spend our lives caring for people in small, seemingly insignificant ways instead of making that big difference you thought you'd make. We might be called to move away from home like Abraham and follow the Lord into strange new lands or against every one of your desires, he might call you to stay right where you are. You just don't know. To submit your resources, your wealth, your life to him is to admit that they were his in the first place. And therefore everything is on the line. To submit your life to him is to risk your life and that's a terrifying proposition. Time is short, your work will be judged. It's all or nothing. So where does that leave us? Well, if we're honest, I think that leaves us in pretty great need. We need a master who will forgive our debts because already we have squandered the time and resources that we were called to steward. And if we're honest, we know we're going to squander them again tomorrow. We're afraid to do anything else. We're afraid to trust God with what we feel like is our lifeline and our right. We would need tremendous courage to serve God as he calls us to to serve him, to surrender what we have. We would need to know for sure that God was trustworthy, that he was in fact worthy of everything, that he will in fact take care of us if we follow him with this kind of abandon. But you see, this is exactly what we find in Jesus. In Jesus, we find a God who is forgiving and merciful, we find a God who takes what we owe and cuts it in half and cuts it in half and cuts it in half until there's nothing left. Until our debts are paid and remembered no more. See, in Jesus, we find a man who does give everything to his Father in obedience, even unto death, who serves him perfectly, laying down all his wealth. A man whose time is cut short with judgment that we might be given an eternal home. And friends, the more that we look at this Jesus, the more we grasp what he's done on our behalf, the more we will be able to surrender our lives, even our wealth to him. Such a gift of grace as this Jesus brings does not free us from giving ourselves to God and his work. It actually frees us to do it. It frees us to give ourselves to God and his work because that is what we were made to do. Because in Jesus we find a God who will give up everything for us and therefore is worthy of everything in return. So as we come to the table this morning here at church at 9 and 11 and as you in worship consider the face of the Lord, we come to ask for his forgiveness and to ask for his courage, that his sacrifice would drive ours, because friends, the time is short, and it is all his. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the The Father Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, 
very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men of our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Myers Irvin, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, Restrain wickedness and vice and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care in keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, health care workers, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. And we pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Cop, Caleb Fleck, Chloe Fleck, Colin Fleck, Matt Harvey, Brandon Johnson, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCaria, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, Michael Sims, John Taff, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, Peter Warren, and all of their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Archbishop Foley Beach and Bishop Chick Chip Edgar, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life or in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Ed Asker, Rebecca Canty, Mary Chapman, Aubrey Crawford, Henry Dixon, Leanna Driggers, Lynn Gilbert, Harry Greenleaf, Mary Hepburn, Steve Horn, Caitlin Huggins, Eric Kellogg, Andrea Kelly, Francis Kelly, Nellie Laney, Kelly McAllister, Lynn Maring, <clears throat> Luana Miller, Joanne Morgan, Shot Paget, Susan Sesany, Trey Suggs, 
and Robert White. Lord, in your mercy, hear in our, our prayer. prayer. We rem remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, especially Mae Batchelor, mother of Val Gleason, and Easton Chapman, and George Cameron Todd, Jr., that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend to your merciful care the people and government of Ukraine that being guided by your providence, they may dwell secure in your peace. Grant to their leaders and all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve their people. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah, our yeah. prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. God's That's peace. peace. Well, good morning again. It's a delight to be uh, in worship, even with you online from a distance. Um, thank you for joining us. A few announcements for this Sunday, the 18th. Um, a couple just to, to keep in mind. It's fun as we begin to press into the ministry season for this fall. The announcements are beginning to fall away because the events have happened. We had a great uh, turnout for our parish uh, picnic, our rally Sunday picnic last weekend. It was um, what seems to be the largest crowd we've had, and we ran out of fried chicken, which is always a good sign. That's how you know it's been a good picnic. Uh, great fun, just a great chance to connect with each other. I'm really grateful for the, the, all the folks who were involved in helping to bring that together. That was a great gift to our church. Um, a few things that have begun and are ongoing. Kay's Bible study on Mondays, morning and evening, is ongoing. If you're interested in joining them there, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to the office or to Kay directly, and we can give you more details as to when and where, but it's on campus in the morning and evening, 10 and 6 p 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, Luke Lucas's Bible study for men is begun already as well. That's Tuesday nights um, here on campus. I believe it's 6.30, but don't quote me on that. Six. It's at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Um, so we encourage you to, um, to explore that if you're looking to 
continue to, to study and grow outside of Sunday worship. I've heard great reviews from that class. I'm hoping I get to sit in on it some this year. Um, we uh, are beginning our Foundations of Faith program, which is kind of like a Sunday school reboot, starting on the 25th. would encourage you to join us for that if you can in person. We're going to be spending about 30 minutes between the services, starting at 10, 15, to, uh, to walk through the biblical story from creation to revelation. And of course, we're calling the story of everything. And the idea is to understand the story of God's purposes with creation from the beginning to the end, so that we better understand our place in that story, our role in it. So on the 25th, we'll begin with an introduction to the, the course and uh, jump in right away to a conversation about creation and its implications for us, not just creation as a static event that happened in the past, but as an ongoing work of God who made and upholds the world by the word of his power and the implications of that creation for us in daily life. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you'll join us. Um, it should be really a great time. That'll be six weeks in between services starting on the 25th. And immediately following that, on the 28th, we're going to have our first parish night of this ministry year. So on September 8th, uh, 28th, at 5.15 p.m., we'll begin serving food, and the lecture will start at 6, the, the time of engagement. There'll be some discussion, some worship, some singing. Um, this, both the Sunday School, the Foundations of Faith, and the parish night are for all ages. There will be something available to you no matter um, how small or tall you are. So we'd encourage you to come to be a part of that. In our Paris Night sequence this year, we're going to be talking about faith and time. So what does it mean for our discipleship to take place in the seasons of the year, specifically in the seasons of the church calendar? What does it mean for us to live in the waiting hope of Advent? What does it mean to live in the repentance of Lent? What does it mean to live in the faithful space that is called ordinary time, which we're in now? So that's where we'll begin September 28th. Discipleship in Ordinary Time, Faith in Time. I encourage you to join us for that. should be a really sweet time to come. Um, again, it begins at 5.15. Show up, grab a plate, and begin eating. It's kind of a, um, as, you, as you arrive, grab your food, and then we'll join together for singing and for some teaching later on that evening. And we've got a ton of great ministry opportunities for you in the community um, that we will be communicating more in the next few weeks, so I encourage you to keep your ears out for those. Um, we're involved in several great nonprofits around town and ministry opportunities. So um, as you're beginning to look for places and ways to serve this fall, uh, keep an ear out. We'll be bringing you a few in the next few weeks. Some birthdays and anniversaries to celebrate this week. Very happy birthday to Charlotte Smith, to Amy Urquhart, Jim Brown, Carrie Bruton, Betsy Porter, Ashley Lucas, Wells Bryant, and Kathy Shimalecki. And then uh, a couple anniversaries, uh, Alicia and Mitch Parker, their anniversaries on the 18th, and Amy and Malloy McCann on the 19th. Congratulations, you four, on your anniversaries this week. Now we begin the conclusion of our service with the words of the prayer for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Continuing together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks, for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. 
for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Mighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised to your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.